We're going to launch off into a really important key instrument of uh, success in a Christian's life. But in Romans 10, these words are very powerful. They come to us from Paul. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, what we need to understand, what's important to see, is this word hearing is not just uh, detecting audible sounds. This word hearing means understand what you're hearing. It's included in the word, in the Greek word, hupo akuo, means to understand what you're hearing. Be under what you're hearing. Submit yourself to what you're hearing. And so when we hear the voice of God speaking to us through Bible study, or uh, ministry Sabbath school, or preaching, or singing. Songs are full of the Word of God. When we hear the Lord speaking to us through someone sharing what God has just done in their life after six or seven years, these are, these are words from above that we need to put ourselves under, and that's what the word hearing is here. It means to place yourself under what you have just heard with with understanding and a desire to understand more. And that's how faith grows. See, God has given every human being a measure of faith in the womb. And they're born with it. He lightens every soul that comes into this world. That's John chapter 1. In Romans 1, it says he's revealed himself to every person. Even through nature, he reveals his divine Godhead. So God is always speaking and he's always talking to us and, and, and impressing upon us the way, truth, and life. And if we submit, if we humble ourselves and we, we realize, wow, this is, the, this is what I need to do. This is the way to go. We are hearing it with understanding and we're placing ourselves under it. So important. But it's also important to understand in the positive, how do we obey the gospel? We know people are, the Bible says they've disobeyed the gospel. But we need to seek and understand what does it mean to obey the gospel? Well, as I understand it, uh, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be 1 Corinthians 15. I didn't change that. So Romans 10 is not there. It should be 1 Corinthians 15. As I understand it, Paul says, moreover, brethren, declare to you the gospel. So if we're going to obey the gospel, we at least need to know where the gospel begins or what the, what the gospel involves. He says, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which I proclaimed, which I communicated to you, which I told you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold tightly, if you hold firmly and tightly clinging to the word which I preach to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's good news. Jesus fulfilled prophetic scriptures. He has died for the sins of the world. That's the gospel. That's good news that Jesus died for our, that God, the creator, Jesus Christ, the word of God become flesh, died for our sins. Don't let anybody ever talk you out of that. Don't let anybody ever tell you that what Jesus did that day had nothing to do with dying for your sins. It did. He, somebody had to cover for us. Somebody had to take the penalty of our broken Amen. lives, of, our, uh, of breaking the laws of God. And Jesus came and took it. He died for our sins, as the scriptures declare. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is all the gospel. It's good news that God the creator died for us. But it's extra good news that God the father raised God the creator from the grave. The three beings who unite to become one as the Godhead. They work independently of each other, but they work for each other and they serve each other in the beauty of love and true faith, the way they work together. Died uh, and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. And 
And he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present to the present. But some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. 500 people bore witness and and put their lives on the line for what they knew to be true. You can't get 500 people to die for a lie or for a fraud or for a, a fake, phony thing. These people died for Jesus. They died for the truth. They knew Jesus rose from the dead because they touched him. They hugged him. They listened to him. They walked with him for 40 more days after he rose from the dead. You don't die. You can't get that many people to die for a lie. But you can get that many people to die for the truth and to believe and to trust. This is one of the most incredible testimonies of the evidence that he's risen from the dead. The other one is when we call on the name of Jesus, God gives us incredible blessings and miracles. Some people say, well, he didn't heal so-and-so of their cancer. Well, that may be true, but he did give them peace and joy and power to live righteously even to the very end as they're dying from the disease of cancer. That's a bigger miracle, I believe, than healing the cancer. I believe it's a big miracle when God heals cancer, and he does sometimes. But I believe it's a greater miracle for a rebellious sinner to maintain love and peace and joy in the midst of terrible pain and suffering and anguish and sorrow. I believe that's a bigger miracle to stay joyful and peaceful and victorious in the beauty of Jesus. And I've seen plenty of people die with that miracle and you can't beat that miracle. The greatest miracle of all is salvation through and by grace and walking and living in that salvation. So God is working miracles Maybe not the way we want them and when we want them. But if you're not satisfied with the miracles you've seen, stay satisfied with Jesus. And in the resurrection, you will not be disappointed. Amen. So we have that testimony. And here's how we obey the gospel. This is how I understand obeying the gospel. But be doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, it's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For, the, uh, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what a kind of a man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, and that's grace, folks. That's talking about the law of grace. Romans 8.2. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Grace is a law. It's the greatest law in the universe because grace is love. God saves us, right? We all agree that we're saved by God. Well, the Bible says you are saved by grace. So God must be grace. Amen? And the Bible says God is love. It's love that saves us. So we're saved by love, grace, and God. They're all three talking about the same person, the same being. And we're talking about being saved by the law of liberty. The Ten Commandments cannot save us. The Ten Commandments, it's not talking about the Ten Commandments. We cannot be saved by the law of the Ten Commandments. But we can only be saved by the law of grace. This is why we've missed this for so many years. People don't understand that grace is a law. And some of us have been afraid to say that it's a law. But the Bible plainly teaches that that I am delivered, I am set free from the law of sin by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.2. That's a long way of saying I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. A long way of saying I'm saved by grace. Ephesians 2, he takes the short way. We have been saved by grace. So, doers of the word. 
People who gaze into grace will continue in the word. People who look, who, this word look is gaze with, with longing and thirsting and hungering and desire. Gazing into the grace of God will cause you to do the word of God, to do great and mighty things. It will. How can we, how can we gaze into the law of grace without wanting to tell people how great grace is? Because grace is God, we, you know, how great God is. Being doers of the word is all about love and appreciation and respect for the one who bestows the grace on us. Unmerited favor. We haven't earned it. No one can earn it because Jesus already paid for it all. It's, he earned it all. Now it pays to obey mama. Mama. And there are two places that I know of, and I'm sure there are more, but I've only found two. I found these two, where it pays to obey the words that God gave Mary to say. Well, first one is when the angel came and said, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, Mary, and you're going to have a baby boy, and his name's going to be Yeshua. Yahweh saves, and Emmanuel, Elohim, is with us. God is with us. And Mary said, how can that be? The Spirit of the Lord will perform it. And she said, according to your word, so be it unto your servant, your handmaiden. So be it unto me. Now, if you're going to copy somebody in the Bible, Mary's a good one to copy. Anytime the Spirit impresses you with something you need to do or something you need to stop doing, the answer should be, according to your voice, according to your word, so be it. So be it unto me. That's, that's really a big one. Major. And here's the second one. And that's wrong too. I'm sorry. I, got, I, I, I must have been sleepy. This is supposed to be John chapter 2 up here instead of 1 Thessalonians 5. So just burn that in your mind. John 2, the marriage of Canaan. And they came to Mary and said, we're run out of wine. And, and oh, we, got, we don't have any wine. And the wedding's not even half over. And she brings him to Jesus. And Jesus said, what have I had to do with you, woman? He called her, what have I had to do with you, woman? My time has not yet come. Little did he know that God was using Mary to launch his ministry? Remember, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing, and I only say what I hear the Father saying. Evidently, God didn't tell Jesus he was beginning his ministry that day. He told his mama. And so, he could, so Mary knew that Jesus was getting ready to do something. She didn't say, if he tells you what to do, or he might do this. She goes, he, she, mothers know how to kick us out of the nest. They know how to get us out there and get a job. They know how to get us going, right? Moms, moms know how to do that. And they know when you're lying about your grades at school. They know a lot of stuff. And this mother, Mary, knew that Jesus was about to begin his public ministry of miracles and Jesus didn't even know it yet because God withheld it from him and he told it to Mary and Mary was she didn't disrespect Jesus she knew Jesus was the Messiah she didn't overrule Jesus she just knew that something big was about to happen and she told his ser the servants whatever he says to you do it I can't imagine what went through Jesus mind why did she do that I just told her my time had not yet come Mom, we're going to talk tonight when we get home. I'm sure none of you have ever had that experience, but it's real. And as these men turned and faced Jesus, and, 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 and like, what do we do? I'm guaranteeing you the Holy Spirit told him, go get the water pots. Because Jesus never said anything unless he heard the Father telling him what to do. And the Father told Jesus, tell him to get the water pots and fill them up with water. And Jesus said, go get the water pots. That's so awesome. And this works for every one of us. 
Listen to what she said. Whatever Jesus says to you, be doers of the word. And the only way to succeed at being doers of the word is to humbly admit to God, according to your word, and only according to your word, will this happen. Will this occur? Lord, you know how weak I am. But as long as your word is in me, we can do this without fail. Because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. This is major, major, major. Whatever you hear Jesus telling you to do through the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, do it as you receive power in, in prayer and in surrender. Now, you know, for years, I've been keeping the Sabbath as a Christian since July of 1978. And you know, we all know there's more. We all know there's more than what we've been experiencing because when Jesus kept the Sabbath, blind people were miraculously, miraculously, when Peter, James, and John, and Paul, they'd go out and they kept 88 Sabbaths in the book of Acts. There are 88 Sabbaths recorded as being kept by the, the disciples and the apostles in the book of Acts. And when they kept the Sabbath, all kinds of things happened. Right? And we know, we know there's more than what we've been experiencing. And for all these years, I've just been saying, you know, there's got to be more. How do we do that? How do we get into this realm where the, where the believers in the book of Acts walked and, and the experience said, well, you've got to spend a lot of time alone with God and you've got to spend a lot of time with other believers in upper room experiences. Now, we are, we are desperately uh, lacking in both categories. Most of us, majority, because I, I, I understand that, that when a majority of God's people humble themselves and pray and turn from our wicked ways and, and confess our sins to God in heaven, that he will hear from heaven and he will heal our land. He will, he will hear and answer. We know that. And I, and, and I know that God is going to get that out of us. And he's going to bring hard times and judgment because that's what the Bible teaches. That's what God does. He knows we're all the same. We're, none of us are any different than the people who went down into Egypt with, with Jacob. We're all the same. They got down there. They had everything handed to them. And man, they were living fat and sassy. And the next thing you know, they're not really that excited about praying together they don't need to pray they've got everything that's what Laodicea does you know Laodicea gets everything we got everything we don't need to have prayer meetings you know maybe if there's an emergency we'll call a special prayer meeting and you know seriously 60 years ago parking lots on Wednesday night at churches were full fact because I know because I, I, I was there I saw it I'm 66 and I remember how people used to go to prayer meetings Americans have become so fat and sassy, the parking lots are almost empty on Wednesday nights. So I understand these things. And God understands them a whole lot better than me. And in Isaiah, he tells us straight up how real it is. And in Isaiah 26, Isaiah 26, verse 9, Isaiah speaking for God, Isaiah understood it because God told Isaiah. Isaiah said in the second half of that verse, Isaiah 26, verse 9, the second half, for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the earth will learn righteousness. They will not, in other words, they won't be teachable until the hard times come. People don't want to hear about God unless there's this big need, unless Unless they've lost their job and they're sleeping under a bridge. Now I need to know, God, what, like the prodigal son. He didn't want to hear anything about God. He wanted to party. He wanted to live it up, quote, live it up. He wanted to enjoy all the things the world could give him. He didn't want to hear anything about God. But let me tell you something. When he was sleeping in the pig shed and eating out of the pig trough, he was hard up to get something from God. And that's what this is talking about. For when your judgments are in the earth, 
the inhabitants of the world will be teachable. It doesn't say they'll embrace righteousness. It says they'll at least listen to it. They'll learn what, what you, they'll hear what you got to say. And, and we need to be sharpening and fine-tuning so much in praying together, in studying the Word, as much as we can. And it's, it's just, it's an amazing thing. Doers of the Word. So, I've been thinking all these years, what do I do? How do I make Sabbath a more of a, more of a blessing? More of a, how can I contribute? How can I be a part of lifting it up? And last night, we were having a big family get together and a beautiful thing, uh, singing with our grandchildren and, and our, our, our nephew and niece and, and David, Rachel and all, and, and, and Zach and Sarah and Rob and Renee. It was a beautiful thing, all these singers and musicians. And it was wonderful. We were singing songs about God. And it was just great. And we were getting ready to leave. And usually you just say, happy Sabbath. And that's fine. I think that's great. But the Spirit told me to say something that I don't know if I've, I've never intentionally said it before when I was leaving somewhere on a Sabbath evening, Friday evening or Sabbath evening and, or, or whatever. And it's just like, I knew that it was different when the Spirit spoke it into my heart. And I said, well, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And as we were leaving, I said, the Lord be with you on this Sabbath day. And it's like, I'm a pastor and people expect pastors to do it, but I want to tell you something. They weren't expecting this pastor to do that. And I know, I know when I said it, the Spirit confirmed it, and I know he backed it up, and I know, it was, I know they, they sent something different and something special because God was in it. It wasn't from me. It wasn't from me. And I could tell, and you could sense I just said, the Lord be with you on this Sabbath. It's like, no one has ever told me that. And I've never said it anywhere. Why? Because I just wasn't listening to God, probably. Because the more we listen to him, the more we hear. And the more opportunity we get when we get quiet before God. All quiet and still and listening. What would you have me to do, Lord? They waited 10 days in the upper room to find out what to do because they knew they better not mess up because they were going out against some, a bunch of people that just killed the creator of the universe. They knew they better stay there until they got everything straight, at least straight enough to go out and do what they were supposed to do. So it pays to get along with God, and then it pays to get with other believers and fire each other up and stir each other up and sharpen each other up. Amen? Amen. That's real. And if you're neglecting that, you're in serious danger, major serious danger. And I'll tell you another thing. I know 100% for sure the Holy Spirit's been talking to you, and you know it too. And he's been telling you, you need to get together with some other believer. You need to get together with some people and pray. You need to get back to your first love. You need to regain. You need to return to that joy of the Lord and that energy for God and that ambition to do mighty things for God. You need to get fired back again. You need to get with somebody who knows what's going on down here and get this thing going again. I know the Holy Spirit's talking to people like that because he talks to me like that. And he doesn't love me any more than he loves any of you. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we're neglecting that stuff, whatever you're neglecting, he's talking to you about it. I know, because when I neglect stuff, he talks to me. And he loves you just as much as he loves me. <laughs> that's good news, man. Isn't that good news? I think that's awesome. And I'll tell you another thing I think is awesome. And i tell you what, you guys know, you need to know that I'm one of the biggest cowards that's ever lived. And when I was growing up, the bullies, man, they had me targeted. I'm talking three and four years older than me, these guys. And they were big and mature men, and they were 16 and 17, but as far as I was concerned, they were men. I was 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. They were 18 big guys. And if I couldn't outrun them, and I believe me, I tried to outrun them. And I couldn't. I never could outrun. I only, maybe one time I outran these guys. Man, they catch up to you, they beat you up. And you get beat up a few times, you, you wish you could run faster. <laughs> and you can't wait to get bigger and get strong and get old so they can't beat you up anymore. 
And lo and behold, I got big and strong. I could bench press 350 pounds and I was strong and big. And, so, and then the Lord saved me. And I went home. I went home. I was planning to go home and beat these guys up. I had all of them on my list, man. I'm going to go let these guys have it, man. Now I'm ready. Boom, I'm ready to go. And two weeks before I was going home, I got saved. Ruined my whole spring break. (laughs) Instead of going home, picking fights with them, beating them up, I had to go home and tell them the gospel. (laughs) Which was far better, right? Amen. Whatever he says to do, do it. That's obeying the gospel. Jesus is the gospel. Amen? Amen. And you want to obey the gospel, you obey the word, which means you, and here's what's exciting. People hear that, be doers of the word, they think that's about performance. It is not about performance. It's about decision. Will you choose to live under the word of God? Yes or no? If it's yes, he will produce it. In you. He will change us. He'll motivate us. He'll inspire us. He'll convict us. He'll give us the willpower to even do it. We can't drum it up. But if I say, wow, look what, that, look what God said to Elijah. I want in on that. Lord, I'm putting myself in on that. I'm going along. I'm putting myself under that because Elijah was a man of like passions as you. That's what the Bible says. He had the same hang-ups, the same defects, the same struggles as you and I. It says Elijah was a man with like passions just like all of us. But he prayed. And it did not rain. And then he prayed again and it did rain. You know, that's great, but you know what's really great is when he did stuff like raising ch- widows' sons from the dead. Now that is some exciting stuff. One of the biggest legalists, biggest religious bigot that ever lived was Saul of Tarsus. One of the most unqualified persons in the human race to be a, a, an ambassador for Christ, helped killing Christians. He was killing Christians. Hardcore legalist. God took him and turned him into a mighty minister of the gospel. They took pieces of his clothing. He was so overflowing with the Lord. They took pieces of his clothing, laid it on people, and they were miraculously cured. And you're going to tell me that God can't use me? I never killed any Christians. Been a few I wanted to kill, but I never killed any. (laughs) Tongue in cheek, hopefully you get it. We serve an awesome God. All we got to do is say, okay, Lord, I'm going to do what Mary did. According to your word, I'm going under that. Okay, let's see what you can do. Amen? Amen. And he got Elisha. Elijah was incredible. He was off the charts, man. Right. You know what I mean? The guy was way out there in the spirit. And so he's getting ready to leave the planet. Right? He's getting ready to out of here with a flaming chariot. And Elisha is his little disciple, his little number one guy. And he said, Elisha, I'm getting ready to leave. Really? Yeah. And it's going to be big. Oh, I bet it is. Okay, here's the deal. If you are close, if you stay close to me, if you can hang in there, and if you get to see me, what is getting ready to happen? If you see me leave, you can have anything you want, whatever your request is. So, Elisha, what's your request? Elisha says, uh, I want double the power that you had, Elijah. That's what I want. Must have shocked that old timer, man. That must have really shook you. Seriously? This little whippersnapper? He wants to do double what I did? Well, you know, I'm sure that went through his mind. What kind of a kid I got here? He's okay. Well, that's a hard thing. But sure enough, if you 
are faithful and you stay close to me and you see me go, it's going to happen. Sure enough, he's stuck in there. Elijah told him to go do such and such. Nah, 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 nah. You're trying to trick me, old timer. I'm not going to do that. I'm staying right here. That happened a few times and finally it was time to go and sure enough, the chariot of Israel shows up. Elijah steps on it. He's shoof. That must have been something. And as he's shooshing up into the air, his cape, the old English calls it a mantle, his cape, he drops it down. And it comes down and lands there and Elisha picks it up. All right, I got it. He walks back to the River Jordan in flood stage. The River Jordan was over its banks in flood stage. He rocks, walks back to the River Jordan. He smites the river with the cape of Elijah, the mantle of Elijah. And he says, and he looks up into heaven, where is the God of Elijah? And whoosh, whoosh, the river stops. He walks across on dry land. And it's recorded in the Bible, double the miracles that are recorded under Elijah's ministry. And a lot of people say, well, that's presumptuous. Double. Who's, who's he think he is? He wants double. Well, I tell you, that's nothing. That's nothing compared to John 14, 12. Jesus is talking about you and me in John 14, 12. And he says, any of you who believe in me, the very works I have done, you shall do also. That's a lot more than double what Elijah did. That's a lot more than double. And he says, anything, I, anything you've seen me do, anything I've done, you will do also. And, he says, and greater things you shall do. Because I, verse 13 says, I'm going to be beside the Father praying for you. Amen. My great high priest. Amen. Amen. My big brother, Jesus. Man, I got beat up so many times, I wish I had a big brother. But I got one now. And I can, I can live under him. He is the word, and I'm happy to live under his voice, under his word. I am under his direction when I, when I surrender, when I submit. And this is part of the package right here. Rejoice always, not just when you feel like it. Not just when things are going good, that you think things are good. Rejoice always. Now, I don't know if you've, le if you've checked lately, but that's a big miracle. To be able to do that, this is not for a faint of heart. This is for people with a, that have a heart for God. You think it's easy to rejoice always? No, it's not. The enemy has so many fiery darts and distractions to get us off the tracks and self-pity and worry and oh, he got all kinds of things to keep us from rejoicing always. Somebody says, well, I think I'm pretty well arrived. I, I'm doing pretty good. The rich young ruler, he said, oh, I do all that stuff. Yeah, I do all that stuff. Are you kidding me? This is, a, this is a commandment. This is not a, oh, if you have time, do this. This is, this is a, I command you. This is an imperative form. Do this. Be doers of that word. Now, don't you run out here and try to do that. If you do, you will flop on your face just like the Israelites did when they ran out of Egypt and fell flat on their faces. First thing you do, according to your word, so be it unto me. According to your word, I'm ready to watch you do this, Jesus. I'm ready to watch you do this in me. Because greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world. So you see that and say, yeah, I want that, Lord, but you're the only one that can make it happen. And I'm going to so enjoy watching you produce this in my life. Pray without ceasing. Most people stumble over that. That word prayer, most of the times in the Bible, is praise. It's the word for praise. Adoration and worship. 
Most of the time in the Bible, it's associated with praise. Most of the time in our, in our vernacular, in our conversations, it's associated with requests and petitions, and that's not what that word's about. In the Bible, when you see the word prayer, you see prayer and supplications. Supplication is the petitions and requests. We don't ever use the word supplications because the enemy has stolen a march against us and he's tried to get us to think that all prayer is just asking God, petitioning God, and even praying for other people. That's, that's prayer. No, praising God without ceasing. And then every once in a while you get on your knees and you spend some time supplicating God, petitioning God. And I guarantee you, it's a lot easier to go around 24 hours a day, even in your sleep, you can do this, because I've done it in my dreams. I was praising God in my dreams. And that's a miracle too. But you can, you can go all day praising God. But it's kind of hard when you're, when you're conducting some kind of a thing at your job and you're, and you're trying to pray for somebody who, who lost their child and they're brokenhearted, and if you don't pay attention, you might you might get yourself in trouble. But you can praise God while you're running a lathe or while you're operating on a, uh, a, a broken bone or while you're uh, stocking a shelf at a grocery store and you can put the food in the right place when you're praising God. But if you're thinking you're heartbroken and you're worried and you're, you're really agonizing in prayer for somebody's need, you might put the, the green beans in the place where the corn's supposed to be. But it's a lot easier when you understand the word and you live under that word. And there's always room to have a praise in your heart, flowing in your heart and your mind, always, without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. Now, that's not that easy either, folks. Now, it does, now notice it doesn't say for everything, give thanks. It says in the midst of everything, be thankful. That's still a big miracle, folks. To maintain your cool, especially when someone does something really uh, uh, selfish or mean or negligent, and, 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 and it hurts you, or even worse, one of your loved ones. You want to just take them and shake them. <laughs> or, or, you know, you get upset with people when people do silly things and they're careless and they're, and they're just, they're drunk or they're, they're being silly and they're, or they, they, they don't control their temper and something like that. You just want to take them and throw them in jail or something or get, get somebody to get them out of here. Right? I wonder what would happen if we were thankful in the midst of everything and we would be able to give miracles to people, help people get miracles. So, they, so, so people like me and you could, could stop being so silly and so selfish and so upset and angry. I mean, I, I saw it. Uh, several of our members, and I don't know, I can't remember who you are, so I'm not picking on you, but several of our members posted on Facebook that uh, talk about politics at Thanksgiving, that way you won't have to buy as many Christmas presents. <laughs> and I thought, that's too much, man. That is too much. And you know, there's some truth in there. We've gotten way too carried away with this thing. And somebody you've never even met Somebody I've never even met, somebody who's never really, really even, they don't even know I exist. I care more about that person than I do a brother or sister in Christ. And, and I, I would rather, I'd rather defend some politician and, 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 and offend some, one of my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and, and hurt them so bad they won't even come back to church anymore. And, and I'd rather do that. If they can't handle me standing for that politician, then I don't care if they come to church ever again. That is not good. And being a pastor, I, have, I know things that I wish I didn't know, but that's happened here. People stopped coming here because of some of the things we have said, politically things we've said in our Sabbath school or in our church or potluck or whatever. Well, you know, 
You know, our, our mouths can cause a lot of trouble in case you guys haven't figured that out. In fact, James says it's the most unruly member in the world. It gets on, sets on fire the whole course of nature, this little tongue. And so that's going on. And so we look up here and it says, be thankful in all things. Maybe if we were more thankful in the midst of this political insanity, maybe we wouldn't say so many uh, disgusting things. Anyway, I think you got the point, right? Or do you want to hear that again? I don't think so. This is amazing. It's like he knows we're going to have to hear it again, and he doubles it up. Here, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. In the Lord, not in the, in the insanity and in the, in the trouble and what's going on. Okay. Ephesians 5, so be careful how you live. Be careful whose words you choose to live under. That's what it's saying. Be careful whose philosophies and whose, quote, truth you choose to live under. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand the will of God. Don't be drunk with wine or drugs or marijuana or whatever. Don't be drunk with computer games. People are actually drunk on computer games. They're so drunk, they don't even know anybody's in the room. Don't be drunk on some TV. People are so drunk on that, they don't even know when their wife's talking to them or their husband or their kids back in the sick or something. They don't even know until somebody tells them, hey, your child is over there crying, you know. We're drunk on everything nowadays. Addicted. Addictive behavior is just through the roof. Through the roof. They had a, a bunch of students go a whole week without their cell phones here a, a few weeks ago. And all, every one of them said they couldn't believe the peace and the, and, the, and the just joy that they experienced. But they went right back to their cell phones anyway. I see people walking down the stairs. Man, watch out. You're going to hit that telephone pole. Uh, everywhere you go. You got to watch out. Over people, there won't be a, it won't be, it'll be a red light. There'll be a, don't walk, don't walk, don't walk. And they'll walk right out in front of you. And they're one of you, they're, 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 yesterday, at least two or three people in the last three days, they just walk right out in the middle of the street. It's, there's no crosswalk. And if you aren't careful, you'll be doing time in the jail because somebody else was looking at their cell phone and walked right out in the middle of the street. That's the world, that's the real world we're living in, folks. It's off the charts. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to be doers of the words, what he wants you to do, and me too. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. And Proverbs says, fools are deceived thereby. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here, here's one of the quickest and best ways to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That covers the whole gamut. Old hymns, old psalms, ancient psalms. There's, you know, 2,000 years old. Old hymns, 600 years old. Spiritual songs, they were written last week. Among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts and give thanks for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's how I understand this. The only way I can give thanks for everything is if I give everything to Jesus, including the bad stuff. And if I really give the bad stuff to Jesus, then Romans 8, 28 kicks in. And if I allow God to kick in Romans 28, 8, 28, now I can give thanks for that bad thing because I gave it to him and he causes all things, good and bad, to work for my good. That's a miracle. So you give the bad stuff. And then you can give thanks for it. As long as it's in his hands. And he's turning it for your good. 
That's miracle stuff. Live under this word. Get this word in you. Deepen your bones. Me too. And let's live under this word. Let's claim it with childlike faith. Whatever he says is good to go. Let the message about Christ in all, that was Ephesians 5, this is Colossians 3. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. All its, all its fullness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative, as an ambassador, royal, holy ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks through him to God the Father. That prodigal son was looking for help. And he did not expect what was coming his daddy was jumping for joy are you kidding me this guy probably smelled worse than a pig because one pig can smell bad but sleeping with 50 pigs that's even worse anyway this dad comes and grabs him and and just puts a new robe on him Gives him his life all back again. Man, I, that's me. And I am not, by God's grace, I am not going to forget how he took me back. Amen. 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 Why would I not want to live under him? Why would I not want to live under his guidance, his wisdom, his loveliness, his beauty. Why, why would I want, why would I not? There's no reason except for selfishness and arrogance. There's no good reason, that's for sure. Obey the gospel? Then Jesus said, come to me. Obey that and you'll never regret it. That's the gospel. Jesus, come to me, obey that, you'll never, you'll regret it if you don't. Every day, come to me, all of you who are weary, and that includes everybody, and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you restoration. I will restore you. That's what that word means. I will restore you into the power and the glory and the beauty of Adam before he sinned. That's a big deal. Take my yoke. That's what you put on bulls and oxen. To pull a big load. Let me teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest. Restoration for your souls. For my yoke is easy. To carry. To bear. And the burden I give you. Is light. I don't know how much light weighs. But I'd rather carry light than darkness folks. That's the only choices we got. You can choose light or darkness. You're already, we're born carrying darkness. Why, don't, why not choose light? Let's carry light. Because light is light. I mean, light doesn't weigh very much is what I'm saying. It won't crush you. Light will always pick you up and invigorate and, 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 and exalt and, and enrich and empower. It's, it's beautiful. We're going to sing this song. As our thanksgiving gift to Jesus. Amen? Amen. How many think he, he deserves this kind of a gift every day, right? Amen. Amen. So let's stand. And I, I know Rich is going to come play his guitar. And Mung is going to play his bass, right? You're going to play that bass? Yeah? Lauren's going to play for us. This is a beautiful song about the greatest gift that anyone has ever given about our Lord Jesus and his cross. So, Esper and Elliot and Michelle, can you guys come get a microphone and we'll do this? You may want to stand down there so you can see the words. 
There you go. We've got to stand down here. I don't think you have, you have the words. Okay. Amen. So I, I realize we're a few minutes over 1215, but I think, I think that the Lord will bless us as we bless him. Here we go. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced head. Washed me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. You reign victorious, high and lifted up. Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came. And gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail pierced hands. Washed me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. The Lamb seated on the throne, crown you now with many crowns, you reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God. Darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. This is our last chorus right here. Worthy is the Lamb seated on the throne. Crown you now with many crowns. High and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, 
the darling of heaven crucified. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the May the Lord bless each one of us to live under his word, to be hearers of his word, to, to, to be satisfied to live under Jesus, to live under his word, so satisfied that he uses us to meet the needs of those around us. People are longing for, for you to just reach out to them and take them by the hand, say a humble, simple, beautiful prayer that the Lord will give you. They're longing for you to touch them like that. Just take their hand and put your hand on their shoulder and just pray some prayer that will give them hope, give them courage. Amen. And when they have received it, then God will give you the courage and the skill and the wisdom, the ability to say, would you like to give your life to Jesus? Amen. Or would you like to re-return to the Lord? The holidays are going to present a lot of opportunities for you to be able to help people and to help bring them back to Jesus. So let's join together. And if you have time today, let's pray with each other before we leave. If you have time or pray, if you have to leave, pray as you're walking out. He is worthy and he is able. May the Lord bless you and keep you in all of his ways. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.